And I think everything else is ready to go, Kate. Okay, sounds good. Well, welcome everyone today to the joint meeting of the Ecosystem Ocean Planning Committee and AP meeting. And uh, my name is Kate Wilkie, and I'm the chair of the EOP committee. And today we're going to be having a presentation from a research team from Rutgers uh, to tell us it's just a project update um, for a project that the council is collaborating on. And the committee and the AP will have a chance to provide feedback and input on, on the project update. So I do not have a big intro today and I'll just turn it over to Brandon and the presenters. Great, thank you, Kate, for, for getting that started. And so let me pull up the presentation. And and thank you all. Thanks for everybody for joining today. And uh, we really appreciate you getting on the call and, and spending your time your afternoon with us for a little while. <clears throat> As, as Kate had indicated, today's really just a sort of a refresher to the group regarding this project and, and a check in and an update on, on where we are with the model and what's been taking place over the last uh, couple of years with model development and, and really where we plan to go for, you know, for the remainder of the project. And so this is an opportunity for you all to, to weigh in, ask any questions, offer any feedback as we continue to to move forward with the project. Uh, if you recall, we, we kicked off this project with the EOP committee and AP back in December of 2019. And that's when things were, were just getting started. And I'll touch upon that meeting a little bit later in, in my short presentation. Um, but that was really for an opportunity for you all to, 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 for us to introduce the project to you all and get some initial thoughts. And as, um, as Malin and Alexa and I were starting to ramp up, you know, starting to get this project started, we thought, you know, using the EOP committee and the AP as our sounding board was, was a good way to go, given the diversity on the committee and the AP, you know, that covers a variety of sectors and interests. And so we thought this was a really good group to sort of bounce ideas off of. You all have been engaged in a lot of the council's EAF, EAFM work. And so, and this, this project has a lot of connections to EAFM, but it also has a lot of variety of other potential applications. So given all that, we thought we wanted to keep you all engaged in terms of where we are going and where we are with the project. So I have a short presentation, I hope, as you all know, I tend to like to talk and cover things, but I'll try to keep it short to give most of the time to to Dr. Fredston, who's going to really go into the details on the model development and where we are and some initial outputs for summer flounder and sort of the next steps. And so that's the interesting part of the discussion. But I thought I would cover you know, some sort of set the stage, um, you know, what the council has been observing with distribution shifts, why we decided to get engaged in the project and sort of where the potential results of this kind of project could be used within the council's science and management process. And so with that, I'm gonna jump into the presentation. And so, you know, I'm sure all of you have seen figures like this before, but they're, they're a really nice visualization of how species distribution is changing. And certainly few are as dramatic as black sea bass. And so these two, this slide and the next slide comes from the Ocean Adapt uh, website, which is developed by Rutgers and, and Malin, Dr. Malin Pinsky's lab. Um, and so these are really nice to see. It takes the uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl information and puts them into these really nice heat maps, essentially. And so you can see back in 1972, primarily the concentration of black sea bass was off of the sort of Virginia, North Carolina border with some moderate abundances up off Delmarva in New Jersey and a little bit of a you know, hot spot of abundance right below Cape Cod. But by 2018, clearly you'll see a couple of different things to me that are the take home message here. One, that the range certainly has expanded quite a bit. And where the center of sort of the concentration of, of abundance now is up off New Jersey and Long Island and Southern New England. 
Um, so that's one sort of takeaway is how the distribution and sort of the range has changed since 1978. And in addition, you'll see a lot more red on the map than what we saw back in 1978. So not only has the distribution changed, but certainly the abundance of black sea bass has changed. And so those are really nice, you know, this is a really nice visualization to see what's been going on for this one particular species. But in fact, you know, we're all witnessing for many mid-Atlantic species, we're seeing changes in their distribution and we're likely seeing changes, you know, in terms of their productivity as things, as they change their distribution. And so this is information that came, that came out of the Hair at all paper, the vulnerability assessment from 2016. This is just looking at mid Atlantic species. And so the figure on the left hand side there is the potential change in species distribution. And you can see that for nearly all of the mid Atlantic Council's uh, managed species, most of them are either have a high or very high potential uh, for change in their species distribution. However, what those impacts may be from a productivity standpoint um, sort of are mixed, right? We don't, many of the species may have positive impacts given the changes in climate. Some may have really no impacts. And there are a few species, um, Atlantic mackerel, Atlantic surf clam and ocean quahog that may have negative impacts because of these changes uh, in species distribution. And of course, Along with all of these changes in distribution, it creates not only biological issues, but it creates management and fisheries issues. And so as fish move out of areas where they, you know, traditionally been fished or the management area or by the management body that has management authority over those things get a lot more complicated. And of course, on the Atlantic coast, we have one of the most complex sort of management structures uh, found anywhere with three different councils, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and all you know, 15 Atlantic coast states that all have different types of management structures in place. So that makes things quite challenging for sure. And so as fishermen were beginning to see these changes take place on the water, and as the science was beginning to take, take shape and, and sort of be able to identify these changes in distributions, stakeholders were really beginning to encourage the council to take a more comprehensive approach to ecosystem issues and really think about these broader ecosystem processes within their management decisions. And so all of that sort of led to the development of the council's EAFM guidance document that they approved in 2016. And climate change and variability and distribution shifts, which is really the focus of this project, is an entire chapter within the EAFM guidance document. And I'm not gonna go really into the details of the guidance document, just other than to say that part of the development of the guidance document was driven in part by these climate induced changes in distribution that we were beginning to see. And you, if you have forgotten or need to read, or ever wanna read through the EAFM guidance document, there are a number of different climate related policies and recommendations that have a lot of relevance to the project that we're going to discuss today. And so I just pulled up three of them and put them in here for you to see. So one of them is to for our council management process to be more adaptive to change, to develop models that look at short term for forecasts and medium term projections and identify new species that are likely to become established in the mid-Atlantic from the South Atlantic and species that are likely to expand or shift into New England. And so those three sort of what are climate related policies and recommendations in our EF and guidance document, you will clearly see in our project that we're working on with Rutgers. And so, so the council has been engaged in a lot of this sort of work uh, in dealing with species distribution shifts. Um, the council collaborated with, with Jim Morley and, and Malin on um, a project that where the project sort of wrapped up in 2018 that sort of spawned the Ocean Adapt um, website with those figures that I had showed on black sea bass. And so that information was really getting at projecting, you know, distribution shifts in thermal habitat and sort of looking at things 60 to 80 to 100 years out. Where do we think, given the you know, likely direction of 
of temperature change, where do we think those thermal habitats are going to impact species distributions? And so, and a lot of that information was presented to the council a couple of different times. And so that sort of information, the information like the climate velocity work, the information like the hair at all paper is really informative, um, but it was considered more in a strategic way, right? It's information that's looking 60, 80 years out. And uh, as much as, as all of us love fisheries management, I don't think many of us are gonna be sitting around the table in 60 or 80 years from now. And so, you know, the council was, this project that the council is engaged in now is really ways to consider distribution uh, changes in a more tactical way, right? Management decisions are mostly taking place, you know, one to two to three years out, maybe five to six years out. And so this project allows us to look at changes in distribution shifts um, that is more sort of in line with management decisions that we are making. So we can think things, think through things in a more tactical way. So again, this project is focused on a few mid-Atlantic species, but we're also interested in, you know, the potential changes in South Atlantic species that may be moving into the mid-Atlantic region. So talking about blue line tile fish, you know, this project is going to look at gray trigger fish. So beginning to not only look at what's changing and uh, happening with our own, with mid-Atlantic species, but some of those species that may be moving into our region as well. And so this research has a ton of potential applications. I will try to go through this quick. I don't want to spend tons of time, but again, there's a lot of connections to our EAFM guidance document and all of the work that the council is doing in regards to EAFM management. This is one component is our risk assessment. This risk assessment gets updated annually. The council actually will see an updated version of this in a couple of months. But there are um, a number of indicators in our risk assessment that are directly related to this research project. So looking at climate change and looking at distribution shifts uh, are just two of those factors. There are also other ones included in the risk assessment, such as you know, habitats, um, implications, and stock productivity. So all I think this project could help inform in the future. You know, the council gets its an update annually on the state of the ecosystem. Again, in a couple months, the, the council will get the 2022 version of the state of the ecosystem. And so this kind of information in this project could help inform the indicators that are included in the state of the ecosystem report. The figure on the right hand side here is our SSC's um, use of they have a matrix of considerations when they're identifying scientific uncertainty and creating a buffer between the overfishing limit and the acceptable biological catch. And so I highlighted in green some of these areas that they that one of the factors that they consider are ecosystem factors. And those areas in green here are items that this project could help inform. So ecosystem effects on stock productivity and distribution and looking at some of these shorter term changes and our ability to understand what those changes in productivity and stock distribution might look like could all help inform what the SSC is doing as well in regards to their decisions. And then there's a whole list of potential applications that I that I have here. We could spend a, a bunch of time talking through each one of these, but I just I'll go through them really quickly just to give you a sense of the potential application of this project. You know, there's the ability to potentially use this in council council actions such as allocation strategies. Recently, um, the commercial black sea bass. Um, allocations had changed and 25% of the new allocation structure looks at stock distribution, uh, you know, and, and where the stock biomass may be. So there's an opportunity potentially if, if more allocation decisions like that are made in the future, this kind of model could help inform those. Through our stock assessment work where we're now including ecosystem terms of reference these ESPs are ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles. So looking at more ecosystem and social information and how that gets included into our stock assessments, this work could help inform those. I don't know if folks on the call participated yesterday was one of the webinars in regards to the East Coast, East Coast Climate Change and Distribution Shift Scenario Planning Project. And certainly, 
once we get to the end of that project, models like this could help shape um, and inform sort of potential actions that may come out of that or the monitoring component of the scenario planning phase. And so there's a lot of connections to this project and uh, the scenario planning project. We could utilize this information for marine spatial planning or coordination. So looking at offshore wind and aquaculture development locations and running these models to see where, you know, the, the overlap of future dis fisheries distributions might look like um, could be really informative. NOAA, NOAA Fisheries has a climate ready fisheries management uh, process that's really thinking about collecting this information, understanding what climate change may be doing to distribution shifts, may be doing to stock productivity. And so, so that the councils and management can be better prepared to make those decisions. And later this year, the National Science Coordination Subcommittee, which is essentially the a national SSC, where all of the sort of the different SSCs get together from across the country and talk about issues of, of, of you know, sort of high relevance that's going on within the SSC deliberations. And so the workshop themes for this year are ecosystem indicators and stock assessments, fishing level advice for ex stocks experiencing distribution change. So clearly lots of relevance for this model in terms of what uh, sort of the SSCs are also thinking about. And so just to remind you, uh, like I said we, the council, we held a meeting with the council's EOP committee and AP back in December of 2019 to sort of kick this thing off and, and for you to sort of introduce what dynamic range models are. And so we presented these different research questions to you at the time just to let you think about what we're trying to accomplish with this project. And, and Alexa will get into these different questions as she steps through her presentation in a little bit. But it was really to understand what can we do with these these models and their potential application and their ability to predict short-term distribution changes. You know, I don't know how much Alexa will talk about these, but these models are not stock assessment models, right? That we're not looking to develop reference points here. We're really trying to understand what processes might be driving distribution changes. Can we predict them um, going forward? Can we look at, you know, predict them at different life stages? so that you know the council and stakeholders can begin to respond and plan to future conditions and, and this was something that was talked yesterday on the scenario planning webinar was really beginning to sort of plan for things uh, going forward and instead of being reactionary can we begin to plan and using some of these predictive models that we that are beginning to come online and at the time we had looked to you all for, you know, we, we had initially considered summer flounder, like squid, spiny dogfish and gray triggerfish were our initial um, focal species we were gonna focus on for this research. And we had looked for the committee and AP to provide any input there on the types of candidate species we should be looking at, things we should be thinking about as we step through the model itself. And sort of the feedback at the time was where possible, we should really be using this sort of project. Um, you know, we should try to integrate as best as we can into some of our other ongoing research and management efforts. We shouldn't be, you know, utilizing these at cross purposes. You know, so there's a lot, there was, there's lots going on in regards to summer flounders, a lot going on into ILIX. We're not trying to replace those those other efforts, but how can this project help inform and help sort of um, lead to better outcomes for some of these other projects that are going on? And so th there was a number of different uh, other species that were offered at the time, but after the group met after that committee, we sort of talked through all of the candidate species that were identified, plus these four species, and really came down to whether or not these species are relevant to council management not mostly the Mid-Atlantic Council, but also the South Atlantic Council. We wanted to look at a range of life history types. Can, are these models better suited for a short lived species or a longer lived species or something in the middle? How do they perform across different life histories? And species that we are currently seeing or will likely see future shifts in distribution. Plus, you know, what data is available to help inform these models. So we ended up sticking with the original four focal species that we had originally considered. And so I think we have a good mix of species to move forward with. 
This is my last slide. I've talked longer than I had anticipated, which is not unusual for me. But you know, as Alexa is going through her presentation, here are just some things that I'm hoping you all can keep in mind and, and things that we would like feedback from, from you all at the end of this is sort of the outputs that Alexa will show from the summer flounder model. Um, you know, what types of outputs and information would be most useful to you, both in terms of content, like what types of information would you like to be seeing and can we produce those? And in what format, what's a good visualization tool to show the outputs that we are getting. Um, thinking about how this information might be applied into our science and management process and decisions. What things are we missing or other considerations that we should be thinking about as we continue to move forward with the creation and developing these models. And again, we're gonna be focusing in on the outputs for summer flounder and do those initial outputs make sense? you know, what does and what doesn't. So, so keep those things in mind as, as Alexa is stepping through those and we'll come back to these questions at the end for, for areas of where we'd like to get your feedback. And so with that, I will stop and I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Alexa Fredson, who's gonna run through the actual model development and outputs. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Alexa. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. And thanks for that great uh, setting of the context of this project, which we're really excited to share an update um, on with you, including some new results uh, that I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback on. So I'll give you a little bit more of the research and scientific context, but then spend most of this time talking about the particular model that we've developed and some of its preliminary results for summer flounder. To start with the context, we know that in addition to the fact that species have shifted their ranges mostly towards the poles in recent decades, at least where that's possible given the shape of the coastline. They're projected to do so even more in this century. Exactly how fast species shift depends on a lot of things, including the greenhouse gas emission scenario. But we can expect, especially in this region, continued northward shifts of many species. Next slide. And as Brandon alluded to, that makes fisheries management a lot more difficult because many fisheries management decisions or uh, processes have baked into them, whether or not we realize it, the assumption that fish kind of stay in the same place and we know where they are. Next slide. That includes the way that we define stocks. Next. The way that stakeholders can participate and have their voices heard in the management of what they catch. The spatial management that we put in place, the way that incidental catch is managed, and the way that allocations are set up, which I know is a particularly complex challenge on the east coast of the United States. So all of our methods for doing these things can be sort of upended or challenged by species on the move. Next slide. We do have projections like the ones I just showed you of where species will shift their ranges to, but as Brandon mentioned, they tend to be on very long time scales. Uh, I love my job, but I don't think I'll be here in 60 or 80 years either. So for you and others to make informed, proactive decisions about managing species on the move, it would be really helpful to have these near term forecasts. Unfortunately, near term forecasting is a big challenge for scientific reasons. One reason is that at long time scales, we can kind of assume that there's a strong correlation between what happens to temperature and what happens to a species. But at short time scales, it's not necessarily true. And by short time scales, I mean these one to five year time horizons that are really useful to forecast. Of course, temperature doesn't actually affect the abundance of fish. It affects their biology. And in responding to the environment, shifts in species distributions and ranges emerge. Next slide. The way this actually happens, though, is by temperature affecting the uh, growth or dispersal or reproduction of fish. Next slide. That can happen at different life stages. And again, while these processes uh, might not be that impactful for our 50 or 100 year projections, Population dynamics and transient processes that in, can include recruitment fluctuation, temperature effect on multiple biological processes, these are really important at short time scales. And the way that we currently model species distributions doesn't account for them. Next slide.
Can you go to the next one? Perfect, thanks. So the approach that we've been taking instead is called dynamic range modeling. And it is a departure from the way that we've historically thought about projecting species ranges, which is looking at the temperatures where species were found in the past and projecting those forward into the future. These are mechanistic models that explicitly write out the processes that I just mentioned, things like reproduction, dispersal, temperature effects on physiology, and uh, simulate population dynamics over space from which range shifts emerge. If none of that made sense, don't worry. There are going to be a lot of cartoons and explanations of this coming up. But this has been the core goal of this project, to develop these models and test them for near-term range forecasting in the Mid-Atlantic. Next slide. We already briefly talked about these focal species and uh, the management relevance of each of them. I'll briefly say something about the biological variation and kind of the different challenge of modeling each of these. And we chose them to represent, of course, a range of, of kind of management scenarios, but also um, a number of very different life histories and range shift situations to uh, develop a model that's as flexible as possible. I'll talk a lot today about summer flounder, which we know is, is shifting up the coast. Great triggerfish is shifting into the mid-Atlantic, so that is a challenge of trying to build a, essentially an early warning forecasting system for a new species in the region. And on my end, it's also a statistical challenge because it requires combining data from multiple surveys. Since for a lot of these, I'm primarily using the Northeast Fisheries Science Center bottom trawl survey, but great triggerfish has not been extensively sampled in that. Spiny dogfish has, but its biology is uh, not perfectly understood and has a lot of population fluctuation, although we know generally it has done well in at least some recent years. So has short fin squid, but its entire life cycle, uh, as we also know, is very short, and so that requires, once again, adapting the model in a different way. So each of these is intended to uh, be a totally distinct application of this model to see how generalizable we can make it. Next slide. The first research question is about forecasting, but I want to emphasize that this is what's called a retrospective forecast, which means we're trying to forecast the past. I'll show you graphs of this later as well, but I uh, do want to be sure that we're all on the same page, that the output of this project is not a future projection. That will require additional oceanographic modeling. So these forecasts are forecasts of the past that we can then compare to the real data on what actually happened in those years and evaluate them. Next slide. We also want to have a sense of under what circumstances are these forecasts useful? Are they more useful in the sooner years, in the later years, every year? Are they better at forecasting certain aspects of the species range than others? So the time scale is a major focus of this project. Next slide. And the last research question is whether incorporating fishing helps improve the forecast. Because this is a model based on population dynamics, so understanding population size and trends, it's very straightforward to incorporate fishing, which is one advantage of this method. And actually, we've done this already, and I'll, I'll show you um, some more results on this later. But another reason to put this into the model is, in addition to helping us explain past data by addressing the mortality caused by fishing, it sets the model up for management strategy evaluation in the future because you can manipulate or simulate different levels of fishing effort in different places. Next slide. So, like I said, our core goal is to test these dynamic range model forecasts, and we kind of hope that that will lead in two important directions. Next slide. The first is to develop this method that we hope will be portable to other situations and regions. The entire thing is developed in open access code. So that means that it is written in code that you could go online right now and download and run yourself with the open access data from NOAA, uh, which we hope will make it maximally useful to as many people as possible. Next. We also hope to continue to work with you and the council to think through how these forecasts can be best be used in management. So Brandon alluded to um, giving us your input on that, which we're, we've heard some of previously and are really looking forward to today. Uh, and of course, your feedback on how these forecasts can be used can shape the structure of the forecasts themselves and exactly what um, eventually ends up being modeled for each species. Next slide. The 
I, I wanted to emphasize once again that while this is a forecasting system, it is not yet operational for the future because to do that, we need future temperature essentially. Uh, at the moment, we're using the historical temperature, which is logged by the bottom trawl surveys themselves. But to project species distributional shifts in the future, we need oceanographic models that have that information. The other reason we're focusing now on forecasting the past is just to be really precautionary and be really convinced that these models are effective at doing what we think they do. So we'll evaluate these forecasts very thoroughly before we, um, or more likely before another future team even thinks about actually making projections into the future of species ranges. Next slide. The basic concept of these models is to take the early years of the time series, which is usually the Northeast Fishery Science and a bottom trawl survey and train a model on them. The, so here in this schematic, I'm showing you the, the actual data in these gray dots of biomass over time. Although of course we're mostly, we're doing this over space and time. So our core goal is not to estimate biomass uh, in general, the way a stock assessment does, but to understand how it is distributed through space and how that changes, which will make more sense when we look at some more graphs. But the the core concept is that we fit a model to the first half of these time series. And then we test the model by forecasting, like I said, the past and then evaluating how well it recaptures what actually happened. So this orange dash line looks pretty good. It actually captured uh, most of the dynamics in the data that it wasn't trained on, but it's also possible that we'll get something like this where the model totally overestimates what happens or that it totally underestimates what happens. So this is why this model evaluation process with historical data is so important. I'm going to walk you through the structure of the model before I get into the results. So uh, there are not going to be equations here, but it does get a little bit technical. And I'm doing this to help uh, you understand what is uh, kind of unique about this approach to modeling species distributions and what's going on under the hood. Like I said before, this is based on a population model. So this is not the way we often think about modeling species ranges, but it is the way that we often think about modeling population dynamics. It's an age structured model, as you can see here with the fishes of different size. And in every time step of the model fish age, they die at a rate, which can be made age specific or not at the moment. It's not, but it is informed by fishing effort. Historical fishing effort. So fishing pressure has already been incorporated into these models. And they reproduce, which I've labeled here as self recruitment. Of course, this model has to be spatial in order to make sense in the context of the problems we've been talking about. And we capture space and as these one de degree high bands off of the East Coast in the survey domain of the Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl survey. That means that every single band has these same population dynamics happening within them. So in each of these patches, you have fish aging, dying, and reproducing through self-recruitment. Of course, to allow species to shift their ranges, we need some process in this model to allow exchange of individuals. And one of the model choices is to decide whether that is the migration of adults or dispersal of juveniles. So it's hard for the model to, um, run well if you do if you allow both adult migration and juvenile larval dispersal. So typically uh, I just pick one. And the last model decision is which of these processes will be temperature dependent. I want to emphasize here and this will be a theme that there is no one model that we are in fact testing. It's a suite of models that represent a lot of different hypotheses, essentially, for what's going on with the population dynamics of these species. So I often end up testing a dozen models for a particular species. One might have temperature dependent mortality. The next might have temperature dependent recruitment. Another might have temperature dependent mobility. One might have adult dispersal. One might have juvenile dispersal. And then we can systematically evaluate how well the models explain the data. Next slide. The actual routine for running these models is conducted in a hierarchical Bayesian framework, which I'll show you a cartoon of momentarily, but it kind of unfolds in three steps, really two steps. The first is to fit the model to the data. And in doing that, you get estimates of all the parameters that were the orange arrows in the previous slide. So that includes things like uh, 
dispersal or recruitment. We don't know those in advance, although if they are in the stock assessment, we can somewhat inform the way the model estimates them in this Bayesian framework. But we need those parameters to simulate the future. So next slide. This is the first part of that process where we fit the model to the data. So this is a cartoon representation of that model structure, and it is essentially another way of thinking about the um, diagram I just put up with the different patches and the population dynamics in each patch. This is, like I said, just for one of the many models that I'll test, but it turns out to be the one that best explains historical summer flounder dynamics, and it has temperature affecting recruitment and some other features that I'll tell you about in a little bit. The core quantity that we want to estimate in these models that would help us understand their short-term range dynamics is the true number of fish in every patch, which is one degree in size, every age class, and every year. We never, unfortunately, observe this quantity, so instead we're modeling it based on equations that relate that population size to all of these processes that we're hypothesizing are important for summer flounder. Those processes include dispersal, which is on the bottom here. Everything on that bottom row that's in a dark box is a parameter estimated by the model. And it also includes recruitment. There are actually three parameters related to recruitment here, which control the stochasticity of recruitment because we know it's a stochastic process and the temperature dependence. It has both an optimal temperature, which the model estimates essentially as the temperature at which the recruitment is maximized and a sensitivity, which tells you how quickly recruitment declines when you move off of that optimal temperature. And finally, there's a general error term here. We also give the model as data uh, the temperature and mortality, which are um, temperatures from the bottom trawl survey and mortality is estimated in the stock assessment. And uh, because it's the stock assessment goes to so much trouble to get a very clear sense of natural and fishing mortality, we know we're not going to do better, and of course the goal here is not to replicate a stock assessment, it's to do a totally different way of modeling, and so we just use their mortality estimates as known. Next slide. So that's complicated enough, but unfortunately that's only half of the story, because we're trying to fit these complex population dynamic models to data that are not perfect. The bottom trawl surveys are phenomenal, they're an incredible source of data on fisheries over the history, but there are biases introduced by the way the surveys are conducted and just even if it's not a bias, a general error. So to account for that, we model the actual data that we observe on each species, let's say summer flounder in every patch age and year, as conditional on this true number based on all these equations about dispersal and reproduction and recruitment that we don't really get to observe and additional parameters that have to do with the observation process. These include a parameter for catchability and a probability of encountering any fish at all, as well as a general error term. And I'm happy to answer any technical questions people have about this model after, um, after I'm done with the slides. Next slide. So that's the first half. We fit the model to the data and get what's in the center of the slide, the estimates of all of those orange arrows, the parameters, that we can then use to simulate into a new time period with temperature data from that time period. And that gives us a forecast. I've called it here a future forecast, but in fact, it's really a retrospective forecast, meaning the model thinks it's in the future because we hide the most recent data from the model, but we know what actually happened. Next slide. So this, to do the simulation, we kind of take away that observation model because we no longer are, have the data and we just run forward this model. We've estimated everything on the bottom. We still know temperature and mortality for the recent years that we're using for testing. And then we simulate the testing years and ask what this quantity in the middle of the slide is and how well, uh, how close it is to the true data. Next. So now let's walk through some preliminary results for summer flounder. I'll start by telling you just generally about how the forecast, how the model fits the data. Next. This is a little hard to read and I'll walk you through it. We're not gonna spend a ton of time here, but I wanted to give you a sense of how I evaluate the candidate models before I even get to the model forecast stage. So you'll, this is a model run up through uh, 2006. 
so this is the training decade, 1972, or training period, 1972 to 2006. Um, and it is showing you the true data, which are in red, for each patch, which is named by its latitude and also shown on the map on the left. You'll notice that the y-axis here are different. So it's showing you, it's kind of zoomed into each one to get a sense of whether the population in the patch went up and down. But you'll notice that most of the density of summer flounder is um, kind of between latitude uh, 36 and 40. The dark line and then the blue shading around it shows the model estimate and the error bars around it. So you'll see that when fitted to the data, the model does a pretty good job of explaining the ups and downs in abundance in most of the patches. It does slightly, it does suggest that there are a small number of individuals in the really far northern patch, even though the survey detects zero. And given that those are so small, they don't have a significant impact on its estimation of the range, which is what we really care about. Next slide. This is now showing you what it estimates for the range center or centroid, which is the weighted range center. So on the y-axis is the latitude of the center of the range in the survey data. The red dots, again, are the actual data. And this, I think, is a great example to show you of the, the modeling challenge that we have been tackling. Because you could fit a line to these red dots and say, summer flounder shifted north, and you'd be right. But it's much harder to say, OK, I know what happened up to 2006 what will happen in 2007? And you can see, if you look from on the red dots from one year to the next, that they're enormously variable. The model fitted to the data captures most, although not quite all of that variation in the range center. Next slide. So now I'm gonna show you how the forecast actually performs. So now you'll see on the x-axis of this plot, the one that looks like blue tiles in the middle, that you have more recent years. This is our testing decade. And these are the data that we know we don't actually show the model. This figure is labeled observed. So these are the actual trawl data results, but the model never sees them. And I this the way this graph is laid out, it has year on the x-axis and latitude on the y-axis. So the y-axis is just like the map, and each vertical stripe is the uh, distribution profile along the coast. Brighter colors mean more fish. And there are a few key features of this testing decade that I think are important to reproduce in the forecast to believe that we are doing a good job of capturing the dynamics of these species over space and time. Next slide. The first thing that we'd like the forecast, our model to capture from these true data that it doesn't get to see is that generally summer flounder got more abundant over this testing decade of data. So you can see that because there are more bright colors on the right of the slide. Next. You can also see that generally summer flounder seem to most prefer this 40 degree north band. That's probably for reasons related to habitat in addition to thermal suitability, but we do want the model to accurately forecast that too. Next. And finally, like in that centroid plot that we looked at for the training data, this testing data also has a lot of ups and downs and we want the model to capture that. That's critical for near-term forecasting. Next. This is the actual model forecast. This is what the model simulates happened in this year without seeing any of the true data, which I've now shrunk to the bottom left in case you want to glance back at it. And we can look for those key features and see how well the model did at reproducing them. Next. The model does project or simulate that there's an increase in abundance over the forecast period. Next. It also simulates that it's summer flounder are most dense in the middle of the domain. It doesn't quite concentrate them as much in 40 degrees north as we know actually happened in the data. And like I said, that's probably because of a habitat effect or something else that we're not currently modeling. Next. And you do see these variable interannual range dynamics. I do want to point out that the overall abundance, so just the true number of fish in the sea, is not perfectly captured by our model, and that's not its purpose. This isn't a stock assessment. Stock assessments do a phenomenal job of trying to figure out how many fish are in the sea. And this model has a totally different purpose, which is modeling how population dynamics over space and time are affected by the environment and thus might be shifting. So uh, if you are looking at this and saying, oh, well, the abundance in this patch said it was this number in the, for the forecast, but this number in the actual data, our goal is really just the relative 
uh, densities, where are there more summer flounder in which years and in which parts of the coast? Not the absolute number of fish. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit more about evaluating the forecast skill. Next slide. This is what I showed you previously for the evaluating the model fit before we went into this model testing decade. These are the actual data on the species range centroid. It has been shifting north. It's currently almost always above 38 degrees, but uh, usually below 39 in this decade. But as you can see, it went up and down a lot. And so we really want to, um, it, for us to believe that this model does a good job of near-term forecasting, we'd like it to track or to simulate a lot of these ups and downs, again, just based on the population dynamics and the temperature effect, because it doesn't see, it's not trained on these data. Next slide. Here's the model forecasted range centroid position. There are a few things I want you to notice here. One is that it does capture almost all of the inflection points in terms of when the species kind of wiggles up and down in this decade. And that's based only on temperature and the population dynamics. It also is a little bit biased south in the start of the time series, which is probably because of that effect we looked at earlier that the model does not put as much density in 40 degrees north as we know um, is actually there. And the last thing I want to point out here is a characteristic of modeling or uh, forecasting, which is that the uncertainty bands, these ribbons, get wider with time. So we're always more confident in our near-term projections than in our relatively long-term ones. Next. And I talked a little, I mentioned a little bit that fishing was kind of already in this model. So we ended up uh, answering this research question sooner than we expected to because the model fit so much better when we incorporated fishing mortality into this population model as a data input from the stock assessment that we've kind of already answered this question and it really does appear to be the case that you need um, this estimate of fishing mortality to get a sense of what happens to the species range because there is a relationship between abundance and distribution. Next slide. So I told you that I've tried all of these different candidate models, and um, this is the current best model for summer flounder. So I wanted to, I put this slide in because I wanted you to have a sense of basically the switches that I can turn on and off in this model. And there will be more switches as more species uh, get, get built out. But uh, to summarize the summer flounder best model, it does have fishing mortality in it, and it does have age structure. Interestingly, it does not have the length data from the bottom trawl survey. They do collect length data, and we tried informing the model with it to help it estimate age structure, but it actually did not help the model and in some ways made it perform worse. And I think that's because um, since we never observe the smallest age classes of summer flounder, whenever one small fish turned up somewhere in the studies domain, it totally threw off the model's estimate of age structure. And actually it worked better if you just ignore the length data. The best model, has uh, a stock recruitment, oh, sorry, does not have a stock recruit relationship in it. It just has uh, autocorrelated stochastic recruitment. Um, it has a dispersal of adults, not of juveniles. It has a temperature effect on recruitment. The temperature dependent mortality model did not fit well. The temperature dependent movement model also did not fit well, but I am uh, adding some more complexity to it so that I will try again, which is why it doesn't currently have a definitive answer. Next slide. So this is my second to last slide, I think, and I just wanted to tell you what it looks like when you fit most of these other models. So one question I often get asked is, well, how do you really know that model is the best model? And so far, we have not run into a situation where there are two models that performed extremely well. It's more likely that the models just don't explain the data well at all. So now uh, we're looking, uh, again, the red dots of the data. Again, this is the training decade or training years. But the... Uh, purple and yellow stripes are the model fit. And you can see the model here over these different patches, which are the different panels, is not explaining the data well. So I just pulled this out of a um, previous model run just to give you a sense of what it often looks like when you run these models that might not have the correct model choices about population dynamics in them. Next slide. So the, this is my last slide, and it's to give you a sense of where I'm going. I showed you these results for summer flounder. I have not showed you results for shortfin squid, spiny dogfish, and great triggerfish. Those are in development, and in the process of doing those, I'll probably or 
certainly develop new features that we can then test against all of the species kind of iteratively. So, um, for example, in uh, we might develop a seasonal model for shortfin squid, and then we might test the seasonal model against another species because we'll already have developed it. So those are not just a question of uh, slotting in new data. There's additional complexity that has to be programmed in to likely get the models to fit well. For each species with those best models, I'll compete them against more standard ways of modeling species distributions and come up with kind of formal statistical ways to evaluate the performance of these different models. As I said at the beginning, making this transferable to other situations and to whatever management applications we can in the Mid-Atlantic is a priority. This is entirely developed as open source code. And another major goal is to tie it up with a bow so that others can take it and run with it in a lot of different situations. And it is easy to repurpose and reuse. I think that's all I have. So I'll pause and uh, turn it back over to Brandon. Thanks, Alexa. I appreciate it. That was awesome. And so, Kate, that is the end of sort of the formal presentations. I, you know, I don't know if you want to take questions sort of, you know, to anything on regarding the presentation itself. Um, you know, if there are specific things there and then maybe after we sort of address any initial questions and maybe we can have more of a, a general sort of conversation and, and feedback from you all in regards to sort of what was presented and, and sort of the, the next steps, if that seems appropriate. Yeah, Brandon, that sounds like a good plan. And, and thanks to you both for both of your presentations. Um, Brandon, yours was great to set, place this project into the context of uh, some of the council's priorities around ecosystems approaches to fisheries management and the guidance document. So that was all great context and, um, the the scientific presentation was fantastic i was really <laughs> intrigued and it was a lot in there and um so so i appreciate that alexa as well and so yeah let's start with with just kind of general questions from both the ap and the committee and then we can move into kind of more discussion um willie i see your hand is up uh, thanks, Kate. Can you hear me? Yep, sound good. Great. Uh, Brandon, Alexa, thanks so much for the uh, the presentation. That was super informative and, and great to see the progress here. Uh, Alexa, I just had a question about the inclusion of fishing mortality, and you had mentioned, you know, the difficulties and and kind of the short term forecasts from the oceanographic standpoint. But I'm wondering, in terms of, you know, you're trying to forecast future distributions, and if fishing mortality is an important variable there, then you're also perhaps thinking about, you know, assumptions around mortality. So. In terms of, you know, when you ultimately look toward developing these distribution forecasts, like, are you viewing, are you envisioning sort of a, you know, a kind of like what we do with climate change with under different emission scenarios, kind of different fishing mortality possibilities to develop maybe a range like that? I'm just kind of wondering how you incorporate uh, potential uncertainty around fishing mortality into the, into the forecast. Thanks. That's a great question. And Malin and Brandon might have some thoughts too. It is. Certainly the case that, of course, our, our historical estimates of fishing mortality have some associated uncertainty and we have a lot of uncertainty about future fishing mortality. I think the way that that gets incorporated into future models is actually somewhat of a management decision. You could say that you're exploring kind of a, a median or middle range of future fishing intensities based on historical fishing mortality. You might do some sensitivity analysis and try different fishing mortality levels to see the degree to which they affect projected rain shifts, or you might kind of intentionally set them low or high or set them spatially varying to represent different management interventions. So I think that's a great example of a question that uh, we can't really answer without input from you all to get a sense of, of what the goal would be for that kind of future forecast. Because, uh, you know, it's one thing if the goal of the future forecast is just to say, where is this likely to move? But uh, if we know that that's dependent on fishing mortality, it has to also be a management conversation. And I, I can just add on to that, Alexa. This is this is Malin. Um, and yeah, Willie, it's a it's a good question. The you know in part I, I think about it as sort of two steps. I think the first step is you know to what extent does the does fishing affect the 
the relative distribution of the species. And I'm not yet convinced that it has a big impact, though I do think, you know, if you were thinking about a forecast with really intense fishing, that might really slow down on the response of the distributional response of a species to, to climate. Um, and then I guess the second question is, you know, what, what fishing scenarios would you want to explore? And, you know, I could see uh, doing forecasts in a scenario based uh, framework, you know, you think about sort of a, you know, maybe three or four fishing scenarios and you could do forecasts under, under those scenarios. Really interesting question, Willie. Thanks for that. Um, I have Phil next. You're muted if you're talking, Phil. Well, either Phil stepped away or he's having trouble. I'm going to go All to right. the. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Okay, so my, it was a great presentation. Um, my question is, it, it's, is I noticed in the uh, towards the end of the presentation, you, you you were saying that the model has an ability to evaluate or potentially predict uh, effects of temperature and recruitment, and at least uh, for summer flounder, it it seems to that that this is one of the big problems that uh, for reasons we don't quite understand. Recruitment has been poor, especially over the last five or six years. And I'm wondering whether you've had any chance to look to sort of dive deeper into that relationship. Is is there any way to understand uh, what effects uh, temperatures having, especially in the estuaries and the um, in the nurseries for summer flounder? That's an excellent question. I have not dug too deeply to answer that question. And I think you'd need other data than the data that we have, which is mostly on the adult distribution. But we were a little surprised that the best model is this temperature dependent recruitment model. And it does. Uh, so what the, what that tells us is that the model thinks the best way to explain the spatial distribution of adults over the past uh, 40 years is that the um, temperature in each patch affects the recruitment rather than affecting something like adult survival. Uh, so I, I certainly think it's hinting in the direction that you highlighted, but I think we need different data on on uh, larval densities, for example, to answer that. But maybe someone else has has thoughts. Yeah, I can. Well, I, I do that. know that uh, that Ken Abel is before he retired, and I guess I assume the Tuckerton site is continuing with it had been following a larval entry into uh, into the estuaries for years and the, the one piece of data that I, I noticed was that although there was some variability in the numbers they didn't seem to show a time dependent shift that is that it was pretty constant more or less over 30 years of time so it, it's not that the production of uh, eggs or larvae it seems to be survival in the estuaries it's uh, affecting recruitment and that's obviously going to be temperature dependent so i think there's some data out there you may want to take a harder look at that yeah thank you i really appreciate that that suggestion and actually we've we've worked quite a bit with uh those larval time series for some other some other projects they're really a fantastic resource for for science and management on the east coast um and you know what you're saying lines up quite quite well with some of the processes that are thought to operate in in other species on the east coast as well, like Atlantic croaker or gray snapper, where those estuarine overwintering conditions end up being really important for uh, for recruitment through survival of young of the year. Yeah, I, you know, I, I guess I would see. You know, the the modeling here as one piece of evidence. Um, just that, you know, across the range of processes we've explored, these distribution shifts are best explained, as Alexa said, by temperature dependent recruitment. Um, 
So I think that it adds, it adds in to other other kinds of evidence. I did also want to bring up this question that Carl had raised in the in the chat um, about uh, seasonal migrations and how that may also contribute to uh, the perception of rain shift and you know to what extent is it phenology versus rain shift? You know that just to point out that. It is it is something we're we're thinking about, and Alexa had put on the one of her last slides um, some models that include more migration uh, and temperature dependent movement. So that that is one way we're trying to test that hypothesis a, a bit more. It is it is tricky to test given the data that we have because the surveys, while they go through <laughs> twice a year, uh, they are they're not there all the time in a way that makes it really easy to look at phenology. Okay, thanks for calling out that question that was in the chat. I missed that one. Um, next on the list, I have Judith. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, you sound good. I, I just put it in the chat in case you didn't see my hand up. It's sort of a follow-up to the previous question. Uh, in terms of recruitment, uh, there's a number of uh, species that are estuarine dependent in their early life stages. And estuarine dependent is, effect is affected clearly by the extent of salt marshes. And the sea level rise rate in the mid Atlantic is, uh, is generally not adequate to uh, keep up. For, for the marsh, the marshes don't elevate fast enough to keep up with sea level rise. Uh, we have, you know, synthesized the data for New Jersey, but uh, I think this is true for most of the mid Atlantic. Uh, one could forecast a shrinkage in the extent of salt marshes, which would mean a shrinkage in the species that these estuarine dependent fish are eating. So I don't know if there's any way to incorporate this one additional wrinkle um, into the models. Thanks, Judith. I'm really glad you brought that up. It is an example of a process that we know is probably very impactful for at least some of these species, as you said, the ones that spend early life stages in estuaries in very near shore environments. It's not something we're currently modeling, but I, and it's certainly not impossible to incorporate into these models in the future. These models are really flexible. You can really incorporate any process for which you have enough data to estimate these different parameters. So for example, you to address what you proposed, we might break down mortality by age class and then have Juvenile survival be conditional on something like habitat availability and quality. But I do think it's important to point out that our goal here is really to say, can we do a good job of near term forecasting with a relatively straightforward process model that incorporates some core population dynamics, temperature and fishing? If the answer is no, we definitely need to pursue these additional avenues. But it may be the case that for these short term dynamics, especially because we're focused on the density of adults, it might be sufficient to have the types of models that I presented. So I think whether we have to turn to incorporating other things, estuarine conditions, species interactions, other processes that aren't currently in here kind of depends on how well the models perform. But so far, they appear to be performing fairly well with these somewhat simple processes in them. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have four more hands up right now, and then I just, I'm watching the time, 2.05. We still have 25 minutes, but I just wanna make sure, I, I do think that, um, that Brandon, you might've had some questions for us to focus on. So who I have next on my list is, I have Greg, then Eleanor, then Adam Nawalski, and then Peter. So go ahead, Greg. Hey, please let Peter, Adam, and Eleanor go before I, I uh, for me, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see, Eleanor then. Thanks. 
I actually have one question because you're like catching this when you showed your model in by patch. So what are you classifying as a patch? Is that like a point from the survey or that you didn't really describe how you did that? And I'm not really sure like how that works in your model. Thanks for giving me the chance to clarify that. The model has to, of course, have something about it that's spatial to be a spatial model that can model species ranges. And the way that we've conceptualized this is with this line of patches along the coast. So it's sort of a one dimensional model, which makes it a little bit easier to model. And each of those patches is one degree latitude high. So there's one patch that goes from 34 to 35 degrees north, one that goes from 35 to 36 degrees north and so on. In each patch are all of the bottom trawl samples conducted at that latitude, no matter how far inshore or offshore they were in each year. So usually at a minimum, each patch has dozens of samples in it. And often it's a lot more every year. We can, of course, change the size of the patch. We chose that to be kind of an intermediate size. The smaller the patches are, the more data you need to get the model off the ground because it has to estimate some quantities separately in every patch, including the population size. So if we gave it 500 patches, it would have a very difficult time. We just don't have enough data for that. But of course we need uh, enough patches that we can get a sense of change in population distribution. So it's kind of a Goldilocks problem. We thought one degree latitude was a good intermediate size, but certainly something we can explore making bigger oh, or smaller. Okay, so if you're using the one degree latitude, then how are you classifying the temperature, which will vary great quite a bit in that latitude between the bottom temperature, surface temperature, even midwater, especially in the mid-Atlantic? That's absolutely true. So within each patch, we give the model essentially a series of data points um, based on where species were found and what the temperature was in the trawl net at that place. So in each patch, we tell it the average density of fish and the average temperature in the trawl net, but weighted by the density. So if there's one toe that's at eight degrees Celsius and it has uh, you know, 100 summer flounder and then another toe has one summer flounder, but was at 11 degrees, the, we don't take a straight average of 8 and 11. It's a weighted average that will not weight the 11 very highly because there was only one fish there. So it's meant because, to give it... Sorry, go ahead, please. And I see that and there are some problems here because they may have done a tow in a habitat that wasn't suitable for the summer flounder and it might not be temperature-based. So That's that 11 totally. degree area that only had one fish may just not be... Maybe it's rockier bottom or something or, you know, something w which would not permit the summer flounder to uh, want to stay in that habitat. So how do you, I mean, I think you need to really think about those type of things. Absolutely. We don't have other habitat features in the model at the moment. It's certainly possible to model them. The bottom trawl survey though does encompass quite a, a range of temperatures. And so we hope that what you described might happen, but it's, as likely to happen in water that's too cold as it is in water that's too warm. And so it might introduce some variation, but I don't think it would introduce like a systematic bias where we would totally overestimate or totally underestimate the temperature preference of summer flounder. Well, and we also actually, test for. You so we actually, we can and have. So one thing the model spits out is, a, is an estimate of the thermal preference, the optimal temperature yes. for whichever process we make temperature dependent. And we I, that does seem to be kind of sane for every model that um, mm -hmm. that has looked good for summer flounder. But I agree with you that it is um, not something we're modeling the whole process of. Okay, one other question, then I'll let someone else's turn here. I, I, I know you selected short fin squid, but I don't understand because what you're doing with your model there, I don't know how are you gonna do it for short fin squid when the NIMPS survey data is extremely poor for short fin squid and such a small portion of the population comes onto the shelf edge. So how are you going to use the survey data for the short fin squid? Well, first of all, I would love suggestions for other sets of data and I haven't started the short fin squid model. So it might just be the case that we can't do a great job of modeling it. But the goal is to use every survey yeah. that we have available to try. Well, I'm just thinking though, because that survey really doesn't fit short fin squid because they're all 
almost to the shelf edge, but you may want to, maybe you should look at some of the data of the commercial fishermen that report back surface, I mean, uh, bottom temperature and catches. That's that a great one. idea. Thank you. I'll, I'm not going to take up anybody else's time, but those are just a few things, but I think it's a good start, but I think there's a lot of, it's a, not a, an easy task here and there's a, so many different variables because just Ken Abel found that summer flounder, like the juveniles that come in the estuary and the, if there's a warm winter, they grow faster and they have more chance of survival. You have all those issues playing out in the estuary that'll affect the population. That'll be sure. But you, so there's just so many factors. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Eleanor. Next, I have Adam Nowelski. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, appreciate this presentation, the information provided. I'm certainly an advocate for the development of these temperature based models to help us in management as well as making sure that we can conserve the resource in the way it's needed. Um, my concern, as I've stated in the past, has been that uh, the assumption that this temperature is a one-way street uh, is something that I hope all the model work that everyone works on provides models to us uh, that considers a, a temperature change in both directions so that we have something that best suits management over a long period of time. Uh, the comments about uh, recruitment and the impacts of temperature on recruitment, I certainly support any modeling work that helps us inform that. Uh, I'll just bring the modeler's attention if they're not already aware that some of the comments we heard earlier about poor recruitment with summer flounder. Uh, our most recent assessment showed the 2018 recruitment as the highest in the past decade. Uh, the last three years of recruitment in that model, uh, in that assessment, was also significantly higher than any three-year period for most of the last decade as well. Uh, so I would just caution, uh, you know, again, I support the considerations for recruitment, uh, but I would just caution the uh, idea that summer flounder recruitment is a problem right now being negatively affected by um, temperature. So the specific question that I had was with regards to the block and centroid plots comparing the training versus the testing periods. Uh, when you were demonstrating the fit of the two, uh, specifically with regards to the upward and downward trend, my eyes were seeing that the model was showing a northward uh, movement, uh, both in the block diagram from 40 degrees north, as well as with the up arrow line in the centroid diagram. Um, but in both of those uh, testing period diagrams of actual data, the last three years, both on the centroid and the block, showed significant increases in abundance in the southern part of the range, down around 37, 38 degrees. Uh, so I was hoping you could provide some input as to why the testing period with the real data was showing abundance movement to the south, um, but the conclusions in the model output seem to be showing movement to the north. I can definitely answer that. And um, Brandon, if you want to go back to either slide 57 or 60 to look at it, you can, but otherwise I'm just happy to address it in words. And so I think the question is, how could it be the case that we concluded in the testing decade that summer flounder shifted north at the end of the testing decade, given that there was an increase in abundance in the south? Is that, uh, does that summarize your question well? Yes, and, and again, that question is based on the slide before this estimated one, which was the actual data, I believe, I guess, or we got to go back another slide or two. Yeah, the one uh, that I says guess, observed. Yeah, yeah, this one. Here, here you go. Here you see the brighter blue boxes uh, that are, in fact, the 14 and 16 years are brighter than anything uh, for 37 degrees are brighter than anything for the 40 degree area. Um, and I don't see this downward arrow trend in the last three years reflected in the estimated uh, from the model output, as I understand it. So you are correct. That is one inflection point that it misses in essentially year nine of the forecast. So, Brandon, if you go up to the centroid plot with the red dots and the band, which is, thank you for, um, sorry, four words. 
in the presentation, so it's a little later. Yep, perfect. Keep going. Thanks. Pause here. Great. So what you're saying is that the model misses this last inflection point from 2015 to 2016, and that's absolutely true. So what's happening is two processes at the same time. Summer flounder is increasing in abundance overall, including sometimes in the southern part of the range, but also it has this kind of intense colonization in the northern part of this domain. And so sometimes that drags the center of abundance kind of further north when they're doing really well in the north. And sometimes when they're doing well in the south, that drags the center of abundance down. This time series has a lot of ups and downs in it, and the model captures all but one, which is the one you pointed out. So it's not that surprising that the model performance gets a little bit worse towards the end of the testing decade, because now it's been nine years since it um, saw any of the data. And it does not get that the summer flounder did particularly well in the south in 2016. You're totally tr you're totally correct. Well, I appreciate uh, your focusing on that. And again, from a management perspective, uh, you know, when managers, if they were to draw a line from, uh, I understand the confidence bounds, I understand the confidence bounds are going to get wider. Uh, it's great to see that, in fact, that last data point actually falls within the confidence bounds here. So that, that's certainly a thumbs up for the model there. Uh, the concern would be if you drew a single line from 2007 to 2016 with the black, uh, the center of the, the point estimate of the model estimate, I assume, that would show a trend in one direction, whereas if you drew a line from the centroid data points from the red dot in 2007 until 2016, that shows a very different direction. Uh, and when we need to make decisions on management, those are the types of trends we're going to look at and make decisions on. Uh, so whatever you can do to highlight the fact, uh, you know, that this end of the model one, you know, you've got to focus more on the confidence band as opposed to the point of it for uh, management use. I think that would be very beneficial to both managers in decision making as well as the public that looks at this and then gets expectations set on what they think is happening to the resource as well as the decisions I think managers should be making in response to that. That's an excellent point and I'll just briefly follow up to say I completely agree and the last thing that we would want is to miscommunicate the capacity of this forecast to accurately project the future. Part of our ongoing work is to identify and quantify for each of these specific evaluation metrics that tell us how well the model does. So at the end of this project, you'll see statistics that say, here's how well the model projected year over year variation. And here's how well the model projected something like an overall rate of shift. So we will be able to say, uh, it might be the case that certain models do really well at projecting uh, interannual variation in abundance of distribution, but like you said, kind of miss the 10 year trend. And that's an important thing for us to keep track of and communicate accurately. Okay. Uh, next on the list, I'm going to go to Peter defer, then Jeff Kalen, and then Greg. Thank you very much. Great presentation. I enjoyed this. And, um, I have a couple of uh, questions and I want to confirm an assumption, a couple of assumptions. So we've got a 10 year period shown on the graph right now. And I assume that that's, uh, that that's a standard that you're going to use for the others, which I think you should be going through. Um, and that we're dealing with annual um, temperature variation so that we, we do not yet have any influence or any ability to parse out uh, the 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 influence of a single event, like a stochastic event, if we had, um, a, for example, a cold snap in one place, or a cold snap in the northeast, or an extreme weather event in the northeast, that might not have an influ significant influence on centroid temperature, but could influence short-term recruitment. I assume that that's not in the model, or it would be difficult to model. Is that correct? That's correct at the moment, although, of course, if it is something that shows up in the survey, then it will will make its way into into the model, at least if it does that in the, the model training period. Okay, and um, 
<laughs> Alexa, could I just add on a tiny bit? Of course. Just to, just to clarify. Um, the So we do, uh, I mean, Alexa sort of alluded to this, but the, the model does consider annual temperature within each of these latitudinal bands. So, you know, if Gulf of Maine had a particularly warm or particularly cold year, that would be considered by the model. Uh, and in this particular version, it, it would be considered in the recruit recruitment estimate for those patches in those years, which then might affect the centroid you know, down the road once the once those uh, fish are vulnerable to the survey and show up. So, um, yeah, thank you. Because and you also uh, raised the other question that I was interested in. And that has to do with the spatial distribution and heterogeneity um, because we, as we saw with the black sea bass, we saw a range expansion as well as an altered distribution of the density. And so we might see, and this is particularly useful for management where we might see a significant shift in one part of the range and not in the other, which would um, hopefully implement a, a modification of the management strategy from, you know, as you put here from 35 to 44, you might want to do, want to do something different in North Carolina and in Maine. So we can get that out of the model. That's actually a strength of this model. So I appreciate you bringing that up because since it models population dynamics over all of these discrete spatial units, we'll get a sense of how kind of how the range shift is unfolding. Is it happening because it's an increase in some patches and a decrease in others, is it happening because uh, the whole range is getting more abundant, but that's happening faster in some places? Is the center of the kind of density within the range shifting around as it also shifts its range? This spatial population model is really conducive to getting those estimates. So that's something else that we can quantify is well, kind of the within range density of biomass. Thank you very much. Great work. Jeff Kalen, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation, uh, Jeff Kalen with Lunds Fisheries in, in Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not going to have more time. This is one of those meetings um, it would be great to have in person because I'm, we haven't really been able to hear from the committee members today, too. And and uh, but I, I do appreciate I know we're running out of time. You're giving me a couple minutes. I, I put a couple questions into the chat box around your fluke model. Um, quickly, I, I don't expect. A response right now, but I was curious about the percentage of annual fluke mortality that you're attributing to fishing mortality in your model, and and how you know what the percentage of natural mortality is that you're parameterizing. Um, maybe you can get back to me; those are in the chat. But I, a couple other things, I, I kind of disappointed that you're not relying more on the assessments. Um, that are ongoing to uh, inform your work. Uh, I definitely feel that way about ILEX. And as Eleanor just mentioned, um, and as the work group mentioned about a hundred times, fish ain't squid. So I, I really would encourage uh, the, the uh, researchers to take time to listen to the peer review of the squid assessment um, that that's taking place uh, Wednesday, March 9th and Wednesday, March 10th. Uh, there's been some really interesting uh, oceanography um, papers. Uh, that background is should be incredibly relevant to you gearing up for a squid evaluation um, in, in this pro in this project. You know, I did listen in yesterday afternoon, and it's it's kind of surprising to me how often fishing mortality comes up in these climate change discussions. It did yesterday too. And I, I learned about a couple new kinds of fishing mortality I never even knew about. And that was the uh, fishing rate on the exiting stocks and the fishing rate on the, uh, on the um, increasing or emerging stocks. So lots of questions, a lot of precaution. And that's why it's the last thing I'll say, I guess, Madam Chair is, to me, uh, one to 10 years is not short term. Um, the longer uh, these projections uh, go out, you know, the more concerned we're gonna be about precaution, reducing 
fishing opportunities. And then very quickly with the four bullets, who will decide the spatial allocation of harvest? That'll be an interesting discussion, one that I hope we can have in person. On an ecosystem, you know, how can we do more than the Mid-Atlantic Council is already doing, or the SSC, or again, uh, the Northeast Fishery Science Center's pop dive people? How much more can we do on e using ecosystem information in making projections uh, from the assessments? And with reference points, you're going to need proxies for squid. You're not going to have an MSY reference point. And again, if you can listen in for those two days in March, you will hear a lot about that. Um, and I also don't understand why this project looks at offshore energy at all. I, I think the, that just makes the agenda way too broad, uh, not workable. And um, <laughs> that's a lot. I know it was recorded, which is why I went fast working on my notes here. So thanks for your time, um, uh, committee and, and uh, Madam Chair. And anyway, I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, um, Jack. Oh, sorry, Madam, oh, please go ahead. No, go ahead. If you have a response, go ahead. <laughs> I'll respond quickly to a couple of things and also say, I, I too really wish this were in person and we could chat more, but um, I, in terms of the fishing and natural mortality, that is from the stock assessment for a summer flounder. So where possible, we really have been trying to learn from all of the hard work that's already been done to understand the biology of these species. And that's one reason why we left the ILEX model for last was the hope that more of this literature would become available. So I appreciate and definitely agree with the call to build on what's already known, recognizing that we're not doing everything. And and wind energy is not directly in the scope of this project. So that's not something that we're aiming to model um, in this specific set of goals. Yeah, I misunderstood that. I guess that, that this is relevant to spatial planning on wind. I'm reading that more carefully now. So now that's okay. I mean, it's complicated. Um, you know, uh, there's some other emerging species we have a lot more interest in than gray trigger fish, uh, like thread herring and chub mackerel species that this committee is is uh, aware of. So we're just looking for relevance. And, uh, you know, it's, again, I appreciate the time. I know we're almost up against 2.30, uh, Kate. So, um, you know, thanks for your presentation and the response, and we look forward to continuing to stay engaged. Yeah, and, and there was certainly no shortage of really excellent questions today and, and just a lot of meat in this presentation. So, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure that we're going to have an opportunity to s discuss this again. And, you know, Brandon and I welcome uh, your feedback as far as um, more topics uh, to, to, to discuss and plan for committee meetings uh, in the future. Um, I do want to make sure that we can hear from Greg. Uh, it's 2.30 now, but Greg, can you go ahead with your question or comment? Okay, it's fine. I'll, I'll ask by email. Thank you. Okay. Well, Brandon, um, I hope we covered what you wanted to cover today because it's 2.30 and you never uh, piped in to say, hey, Kate, we need to talk about something else. So um, you do you have any closing words for us? Yeah, no, I thank, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I didn't want, I thought the questions were really good and I, and I think there were questions and comments that I think were helpful, at least to me and, and Alexa and Malin as we are thinking through a lot of these, you know, we wanted to wait a little bit to be able to present to you all some, some outputs to show what we're, what the models are, are capable of doing, where we need to explore more. And so I, I definitely think not, we will be meeting again with the EOP uh, committee and AP, and hopefully it will be in person, you know, more than once. And certainly this is going to be presented to the council. And so, um, so there's going to be a lot more opportunity for folks to weigh in. We just thought this was a good time to do a check in. It had been a little while since, since we've talked to you all about this project and, and we are moving along a little bit quicker now. And so I think we'll be able to check in, you know, at sort of, quicker time steps with you all in regards to those. And so, Jeff, yeah, I, I put the offshore wind thing in there. I'm, I'm sorry, it was, again, it was not a focus of this. It's it's just thinking about potential applications of this kind of information. It's not a focus of this project at all. It was where I was putting in there where we could utilize this within EAFM, within offshore wind, all, all of those sorts of spatial considerations that we are thinking about within the council. And so I'm sorry if I 
No, it's, I, I was speed reading, Brandon. I'm sorry about that. I got it now. Thanks. Yeah. Um, no, but I thought the feedback so far was was great. I, I didn't know if we would need a full hour and a half. I know uh, now in the future we'll block off some some additional time. And like I said, and hopefully we'll do this, be able to do this in person and spend quite a bit more time as as we get further along in the project. Okay. Well, and I see Alexa put her uh, email here in the chat and Greg, please do follow up with questions or comments um, with me and Brandon and with Alexa. Um, and anyone else who might have questions or comments that we didn't get to today. So thank you everyone for your time. Thanks so much to the presenters today and for everyone who engaged with thoughtful questions. So I guess that's a wrap. Yeah. Thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye all. Bye.